My name's Guy Griffiths, as Rachel said. Thanks, Rachel, for the intro. Um, GG Fit's my company. I'm basically about getting people fitter and healthier by working with health clubs and gyms on retention. Um, but I also lately have been helping clubs grow by uh, getting ex-members and non-members back in for health checks um, on things like Tanita and InBody. Um, I also host the Your Dream Gym podcast. And if I wasn't here today at the Independent Gyms Conference, I would probably be on top of an Alp about to snowboard down. Um, or I might be watching the Tour de France, actually, this time of year. Uh, so we've got uh, Amy and Steve and Andy. Let's, let's, let's go in that order. Let's start with Amy with a, a quick 30-second intro. And if you weren't here, yeah, pick up a mic, please. If you weren't here, where would you rather be? It should, it should be on already. Um, I would definitely rather be, not rather be, sorry. <laughs> if I wasn't here, I would like to be in a spa, relaxing. Nice. Massage, nice spa. Uh, Steve Co Fitness. Uh, I definitely want to be on holiday, enjoying the sun somewhere. It's been a long time since being anywhere. But odds on, if I wasn't here, I'd be back at home working, realistically. I'm Andy from Lift Gyms in Edinburgh, and if I wasn't here, I would have quite enjoyed being at Edgebaston to watch the final day of the cricket today, which England convincingly won, which makes yes. a change. Yeah, no, no, no one's been watching that at all, I'm sure, today, or keeping an eye on, the, on, on that amazing innings. Uh, so thanks, guys. But yes, in terms of, you know, we've got a, a great split of the, the gyms from across the country, so from Southampton to Edinburgh to um, Newark. Um, so some great opinions here from gym owners, but like I said, we want to get you guys involved as well. Um, I've done a couple of polls, well, I've done more than a couple of polls on social media. I've done thousands of polls on social media. But in terms of what independent gym owners wanted to hear about um, on Facebook and on LinkedIn, most of you wanted to talk today about increasing prices, increasing costs, um, and a little bit about recovering members as well. But I've also been talking to people today and talking to people on social media and even in real life about um, what independent gym owners want and need at the moment. And you know, those three topics of increasing costs and what are we doing about it, increasing your prices and, and how to go about that, and if so, how much, um, and then recovering lost members are definitely three themes I want to cover this afternoon. But if you've got other things that you want to talk about as well, then let, let, let's get into those too over this half an hour, 40 minutes. Otherwise, we're going to have to go to the bar early. Okay, so I have a poll here, which I'll try and bring up. In fact, let me leave that there for the moment because you can join this with your QR code if you wish. Um, but then there'll be a, an interactive bit going on behind us as well, talking about these three questions. Go to slido.com pop in that number on your phone, and then you can get into the questions, which I'll put up in a minute. But in terms of increasing costs and what independent gyms are doing about it, this is not putting up prices, that's point number two. But in terms of the, the, the massive increases in costs that we're seeing in energy um, and in generally running a business, um, yeah, want to talk a little about energy saving and cash flow. Um, and I'm going to ask Amy to to kick off and talk for a minute or two about what you think independents should be doing about increasing costs. Yeah, obviously, really common one, and it doesn't really go away, especially post-pandemic, increasing costs all over the place. Um, I, myself, have had ridiculous increases. Um, utility bills for myself went from 17p per kilowatt hour up to 38p, so I'm sure everyone's suffering similar situations. Um, but I think we're very quick to presume we should let the members absorb that increase and I don't think necessarily we look outside the box enough um, obviously I come from a real like beating the, the drum for sustainable fitness so a lot of my knowledge on that side of things is where I think we could win as an industry I think it's a very niche little pocket in the fitness industry that's not really looked at enough so obviously myself I set up one of the UK's first eco-powered gyms um, and by doing sort of green things, green initiatives, and I don't mean necessarily ripping out lots of kit and putting in expensive eco-technology, you can 
go plastic free, you can upcycle your fixtures and fittings, but by doing that you tick some sustainable boxes and you're actually eligible for innovative and green grants at your local authority. So, okay, you're getting price increases from what feels like every angle at the moment, but there is pockets of money. If you just tweak things in your business, there is money on the table out there that I'm not necessarily sure, as an industry, we're aware that they're there. Okay, and I, so think it's the way, it's, I think it's the way forward. And, and, and green, green funding, not necessarily green funding, but there, is, there, are, there are lots of, of yeah. funds out and there. And innovation funding into. as well. So if yeah. it's an innovative idea, then your local authority, you, if you just literally Google green grants in whichever county you're in, they, will, or they should direct you to your local authority and you'll be able to see what grants are available and how you go about obtaining it for your business. Okay, so yeah, great advice. Thanks, Amy. Uh, Steve? Andy, who wants to, or yeah, which of you wants to pick up the next on how are you coping with increasing costs? Uh, my take on increasing costs, I'd say, is tough. They're, control what you can control. If, if you've looked to get the best energy price you can get and you've got it, that's it, deal with it. They're the prices you're paying. If you've looked, in, looked at all your expenses in your business and drive every expense can, down as much as you can, for the ones that aren't relevant to, relevant to increasing sales, you've then done it. The rest of your time then needs to be spent on focusing on increasing sales. So it doesn't mean stopping all your marketing. If that's going to generate you income, then you pay that cost. If you've, it's, it's like with if, people, if you're renting your gym. If your rent's gone up, the odds on you having the opportunity to move gyms and rent another gym is probably really small. So to spend any amount of energy focusing on that as a negative, you can't do anything about it. So all your energy has to be then shifted to the positive side of going, right, how can we get increased sales to cover the costs off what's, what's gone up? Good point, Steve. Andy, what else would you add? There's not too much left, is there? Um, no, getting your members involved is a big thing for us. So encouraging people to bring their own coffee cups, um, like most coffee chains do now and rewarding that with potential small discounts on the coffee. Um, other things as well, your, look at your large energy using appliances. Are there things that you can do to reduce the amount of energy they're using? So we're looking at um, changing the time schedule of our air conditioning. Can we reduce that uh, throughout the day? You know, Upstairs, we've got a nice big ground level um, floor, which has open access doors at the front and the rear. And as long as we're not in breach of fire code violations, can we reduce the air conditioning cost by letting in more natural air? Uh, and members enjoy that as well. So yeah, I mean, obviously the guys have covered it very thoroughly, but get your members involved uh, and look at what extra little things that you can do to drive, drive everything down, as Steve said, but then also to actually reduce the usage of other items that you maybe haven't thought about, like computers at reception, something we're all guilty of, TV screens that aren't in use, all of these kinds of things. You know, it's a little bit, but at this point in time, I think, as, as Tesco said, every little helps. Or Yeah, Tesco's or marginal gains is the other one. That's a Another keen cycling fan. Um, so, yeah, th thoughts from the audience on, on I either pop your hand up and a, and a microphone will come running, running, that is, Rob, will come running around. Um, or pop them on the Slido. Um, but I think that, that last point of involving members, I think, is key. Uh, you know, asking your members what they, you know, do they need the aircon on? Yes, of course they do. Um, not so much an independent gym thought but you know talking to a lot of leisure operators can we just you know reduce the pool temperature by half a degree no is the answer apparently from a lot of local authority leisure centers because we will lose all of our members um debbie yes i'm sure you've got something on cost savings from a financial point of view well it's from um, another gym actually on the facebook group uh -huh. and it goes with sustainability they talked about changing the showers to push buttons because you know how annoying it is to keep pushing the button when you have a shower and they said people use the showers a lot less so lower water bills but also lower um, gas bills for heating the water yep. so I thought it was a great idea absolutely yeah no and a, and a really simple one or just going full on Wim Hof and saying all the showers are cold right it's good for you maybe maybe a bit extreme again um, water, there's, there's quite a lot in water rebates as well. Um, that's something to look at from an energy point of view. Do you, do you know, Amy, you probably know a bit more about that. 
Yeah, I know a little bit about it. Um, I know there was a gym. I can't remember who told me. There, there was a gym. Wasn't it you? <laughs> there was a gym that had a big awesome. rebate on um, water. But, there was, you know, there's like rainwater collection. I think, as a whole, all these little things, it's really important to get a decent energy monitoring audit done. So if you go to your energy suppliers, for example, they'll probably tell you that this is the best offer they can do it, and, they, and that they're being environmentally conscious and it is a load of bullshit really they'll greenwash you um you need a proper energy monitoring and you've got to do that quite well and lots of little devices that really make it bespoke to your building um yeah. and they look at every tiny little aspect and it's it's going to be different it's not like there's one answer for we are independent gyms for that reason so we're all quite different in terms of the size of our spaces whether we own the building whether we're under lease or so it there is audits. I've got a really good 20-page, which I won't go through, 20-page PDF of different things you can have done as an audit within your facility. So if anyone wants it, it will tell you exactly what you can look at. So I'm happy to yeah. send it out if anyone wants it. Yeah, that'd be brilliant. And, and wa wa water is a great example. If you, if you all understand your water bill, well, hands up who understands every item on their water bill. But having a review of that, as a couple of clubs I've heard of have had six, seven thousand pound rebates and forward reductions as well. In other words, they've been paying too much on their grey water and their waste and their this and their that and their, their other. So there's money that you can have in your bank now, but also save going forwards by doing reviews like that. Um, other thoughts? John's ha half raising his hand on energy. Rob? I, I, I can hear you, but not everyone else can. Surely Andy was on about heating, not air conditioning. Andy. Uh, I know it's hard to believe, but in Scotland we need air conditioning as well sometimes, John. <laughs> <laughs> Any other thoughts on increasing costs and how you're handling it? There's a question here from Anonymous. We, all, we just replaced all fluorescent lighting with new LED light systems and use the energy cost savings to fund the purchase. Sounds a bit utility warehouse, but hey, if it works, it works. Thoughts on that or experiences with... UV versus uh, LEDs? Yeah, LEDs definitely save energy, but you can also go one step further. You can get little um, controls on those LEDs that can further reduce the bill by about 30%. So you can, there's always more you can be doing, and it's just about like step changes, but LEDs definitely do save a lot of money. Excellent. So, yeah, every little helps, or marginal gains. Yeah, go on, Steve. Well, I'll add to that. On, so our gym was built three years ago. One thing we had put in was... Uh, roof skylights and they make a massive difference so it's like with any saving you're going to make though you have to weigh up what it's going to cost you to what it's going to save you but if it is an option to have them put into your gym they're letting in natural light you can turn your lights off in the gym in most areas in our place we've got big roller shutter doors as well so we have the roller shutter doors open light coming in from the skylights so our energy bills are then kept Low. We also have an air source pump. We don't have any gas whatsoever. We have an air source pump which heats all the showers and a poor effort at the heating, uh, but it's a gym. I don't think people are expecting gyms to be boiling hot when you go in them. Nice. Okay, well, we, we can come back to increasing costs, but let's, you know, in the interests of the pub, and an easier poll for you this time. You don't actually have to write words in. This is just uh, three choices. Have your prices gone up? If so, by how much? Or have you kept them the same? Um, I don't know, Amy was kind of like, D don't put it on to your members. But, uh, well, Steve, you've got the mic. You finish, so you can start. Are you increasing your prices? And if so, by how much? We're increasing our prices by nothing. Um, we won't be putting our prices up. Uh, I'd say our prices are probably more expensive than any other gym around us by a bit anyway. Reassuringly uh, expensive, yeah? Yeah, it's, you get what you pay for. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but no, we won't put the prices up and we'll use this as a time to try and increase our market share of how many members we've got rather than putting the prices up. The risk you've always got with anything when it comes to prices, we put our prices up to cover the increased costs on things Everyone else is feeling the pinch as well with petrol, their energy costs. Depending on what the price of your facility is, <laughs> will it lose your members? It might not. It might cover the cost of everything. Um, I think like with anything, it just gives you different opportunities to do things. So 
for us, we haven't put the, we haven't actually brought our prices up in eight years, but we've done things in a way where the owners have stepped away from the business and it's all systemized, so we now don't have to work in the business. So we haven't actually changed the price, but in a way we've changed the product, which is our justification for what the price now is. Good answer. Who wants to go next? I think there was a really key point. I sat in on um, Simon's, wherever he is, Tanita's chat next door. Um, and he made a really good point. He said it's, and it was a really great little quote that I stole that says it's easier to get more from who you've already got. And it's a great point. I think COVID for most of us, it definitely did for me, it was a bit of a panic initially. But actually it makes you really sit back and go, okay, what else can I do here? So you just have to diversify, not rely on one revenue stream. So in my case, I, I bought in sustainable gym wear. So we, that, the sales of that really helps another revenue stream. I, I purchased this a f sort of wholesale of sustainably packaged proteins and supplements as well. So it made me, I think the key is to not just think of, yeah, whack it straight on the membership cost. It's like, what else can we do to make our members that we've already got spend a little bit more? Yeah, so, so a, a little bit of value add in that first instance of something like a Tanita or but, but, but something that's adding value to what you're already getting, which is kind of I, what I hear Steve saying as well, but also diversifying into other markets, verticals, as long as it has sustainable in front of it for you, Amy. Yeah. yeah. Andy? Um, we are putting our prices up, but we're looking to add significant value with that from areas that don't necessarily cost us a, as a business uh, a huge amount more. So opening up our previously private um, training app that our coaches used, opening that up to all members to be able to track their own workouts, um, delivering recipe books to members on a monthly basis, uh, and offering additional services kind of above and beyond that on a, a, a pay-as-you-go style basis. Um, and then also, like it's just been said, new revenue streams, so a class-only membership, which is something that we haven't ever done before, but we've noticed a growing demand in our membership base, so people coming in for day passes. But I think the key point here is before you look at implementing any price changes, do you actually understand what your existing members think of your business? Like how many people here, when was the last time you spoke to your members and, and found out how would you rate our value? Because if you, you are going to put your prices up, but your members already think that you offer low to moderate value, that's not going to go down very well. But if you're at a point where your prices, your members think that you deliver exceptional value, you've probably got more ground and you're less likely to lose members by putting your prices up. Then the other big tip would be, when was the last time somebody did a competitor analysis? Now, having started off with Virgin Active, I know that the big chains are always looking at everybody that's around them. What do they offer? How much are they charging for it? Where are they? Where do they get their customers from? As independent businesses, we should be doing that as well. We should be looking at who's around us, what they do, what they offer, and how much they charge for that. Contrast that to yourself, and it will give you an idea of where you should be within the market. And then on top of that, do your members support your belief in what you should be doing with your prices? They'd be my two big things. Look to add value if you are going to put your prices up but do it from a standpoint of understanding your members and what they think of your current pricing structure. Um, and just a shout out to Terry as well here, a bit of a change to the business model, but it's worked fantastically well for him. And he's again, I know how much thought and effort he put into that and how much of a rapport he's got with his members and in the local area. So that to me is absolutely key before you do anything. You have to understand if you have a basis to do that. Awesome, awesome answers. I, for, for me, that's nailed it all, but for those people who are, well, the 75% that are saying the same, that's either three out of four of you who voted, or six out of eight who voted, um, what other value are you adding if you're keeping your prices the same? Anyone else want to join in? We can slowly hear the pub chants growing in volume. Yeah. John. Always John. I'm Thanks, the most Andy. interactive host ever. Thank you. Look at, look at him move. <laughs> here comes, so, uh, here comes we, Rob bringing the mic back to the table. We, we've kept our prices the same, but we've added value. So, Tanita, uh, we introduced the hub into eGym. Yep. Uh, we've done Braun. Um, we are going 24-7. So, we've done a myriad of things to uh, do that. We've also done the cost-saving stuff as LED lights and all of that kind of stuff. Next thing is to look at water and our energy supply, we're currently locked into those. So, you know, it's, it, we, I think the pandemic allowed us to go through our business and analyze everything from top to bottom and then put those things into place. And that's what I've done for the last two years and continue to do that 
obviously after our discussions. God. Of course. But I, th it, I, I think, well, hopefully this is also, also a, a, an ongoing process, which I think is what a, well, all, all three of you are saying. Yes, it's been a, there's been a review, but it's not, there we go, we're back, you know, the new normal, back from the pandemic. It is something that needs to go on and on and on all the time, as, as you say, John. So, and, and anything else to add on increasing prices? As I say, you, I think all three of you nailed it with your answers. Yes, a question over there, Rob. He's getting his steps up. I'll race, yeah. You must be at 10,000. Uh... <laughs> yeah, give him a head start, Andy. Yeah, hi. We actually um, put our prices up by five pounds, roughly, per membership category. And we just made a calculation that, one, people expect prices to go up. They're paying more for most other things, so why not our industry? Uh -huh. And we worked out that uh, by that small increment, in order for it not to work, we'd lose 233 members. It hardly changed. So we're roughly 7,000 better off per year from that small change. Mm. And on top of that, we, like the rest of you have been saying, COVID made us look at our business deeper, more deep than ever before. We saved 8,000 on licenses for music. I don't know if you were here in the presentation earlier, but we did exactly that. Um, we have push buttons on our showers. We've had that from day one. So that's sort of controlled. Um, we went around the building at night time when the cleaning company was there and found out the whole building was lit up for three hours at night while they were cleaning. So we made sure that they cleaned zone by zone, switched stuff off. We'd never done that before. Night, so vision, night vision goggles for the cleaners? Is that a Sorry? Night vision goggles maybe exactly, for the cleaners. Yeah, exactly, yeah. I mean, it just, it just made you look at the business differently. We, we changed the format of the amount of Les Mills classes we were providing, for instance. So we made some, So we looked at every facet of the business. So there was a price increase, a lot of cost reduction, um, but we're still chasing more members and we're looking at new ideas that, that we could implement as well for additional revenue. So we, we looked at every aspect of the business. I think COVID forced us into that position, but I think now we're coming out the other side, we'll be in better shape going forward. Nice. Thank you. Which I think leads nicely on into what are you doing to... I mean, this could be recover members. Um, as I say, there might have been a little bit of a angle that I put on the question, but, but energy and price increases were, you know, both popular, 18% and 27%. Um, but in terms of recovering members, 59% of the people on the Facebook poll said we want to talk about that at the Independence Conference. So you've got the mic now, Andy. Recovering members or getting new members in, or what? You know, what's what's new? What's new? Um, so Edinburgh, just a little bit of background for those that don't know it, is quite a transient city, uh, very high student population and lots of people that kind of come through and obviously the pandemic exacerbated that. So we've obviously got a database of all our former clients, over 5,000 people now. Um, and a large, massively large percentage of the reason for leaving the gym is relocation. Now, as independent gyms, I think we all pride ourselves on the level of service and connection we have with our members uh, through our staff team. So what can you do to expand the reach? Currently, we're all bound by the physical confines of our facility, but we're offering online coaching now, uh, which is led by our staff team. So we've got 5,000 new people that we can offer a, a crazy, insane launch offer on the online coaching, and you only need a small percentage to take that up for it to be a significant new revenue stream um, for the business. And then all of the classic things that, that have, always, have always worked, but really putting effort into them, so referral campaigns, um, reaching just simply reaching out and, and silly things like handwritten letters to longer term members that have left you it makes a real difference when you get something like that through the post um, and again it doesn't cost a huge amount to do but the, the main one for us is looking at ways that we can expand beyond the confines of the four walls of our business and the, the online coaching is is a huge part of that uh, and it's, it's already making a big difference for us and then obviously you can adopt things like small group training etc to get more out of less clothing lines um, and working with trusted supplement retailers as well uh, is another good way so all, all these little kind of additional income streams that you can do are all super super useful yeah and just just getting just getting footfall basically getting people to either to the club or just interested online but that ex, ex members i'll say it i've said it at every conference so far i think they're just it's the, the biggest uh 
untapped data source, I think, in the fitness industry. Your ex-members don't all hate you, okay? One or two of them do, but there are thousands of them who don't. And they just, they just need that nudge, a letter's great, a phone call's even better. But if you, you know, if you, if you send them emails every month, you'll get one or two of them eventually. But yeah, think, think outside the box in all the different ways. What else um, have you got, Amy? It's probably a slightly unusual one, maybe, but um, I'm sure other people have probably felt this as well. Over, lo particularly lockdown one, suddenly the whole world was running experts. So a lot of members, when that's all you could do, you know, and people don't necessarily have equipment at home, I found quite a lot of members left or slowly sort of dripped out of the business into, and they suddenly became runners. Yep. And most of them were injured by the end of lockdown one. So in a weird way, it came about that I'd, I'd linked up this new partnership, which I'm sure places like this exist, exist all over the place. Um, and close by, there's a rehab clinic to me. Who, he's a, actually a lower limb specialist, so he specialises in like ankles, knees, feet. But if you link up with someone close by who is a rehab specialist, they don't want repeat business. They want to fix people and they want them to go. So I was very quick to jump on a, a small rehab clinic close by who, was, who we joked about all these runners that were just injuring themselves because they were going from not really ever running to this 100 miles in a month nonsense and all getting injured. So all we, all we did was create a really like slick link between where they got injured. <laughs> a guy called Nick fixed them, sent them to me with a programme. And because it was a programme written by a specialist coming into a small business where he knew and he had the reassurance they were going to be looked after, that we had a really good, strong link. So that was a new partnership that came about and brought back some members that possibly may not have done. So nice. that was a, a work yeah. for me. <laughs> and, and, and independent businesses working with independent businesses, right? Yeah, there, was, there, there, were, a lot of, there were a lot of big guys and girls out there running. I, I mean, I've, I've always been a runner, but you'd be like, mm, they're, they're missing the gym. Not so much with swimmers during lockdown. That, that was really tough. The swimmers really were hit hard, unless they were just jumping in a lake. Um, do, if you've got any thoughts, then please add them onto the Slido on your phone on w what you're doing to recover members. I won't necessarily pick on you and ask you where you'd rather be. Um, but, yeah, please, please do join in. Steve, what else have you got in terms of member recovery? Uh, well, during lockdown and COVID, like everyone else, lost a lot of members. I'd say we, we kept half uh, by setting up our online system. COVID gave us a time to set up an online system redo part of the gym, uh, systemize all our processes. And the way we've got our members back is by having what we had before. We've got a very good gym, everything's systemized. People buy into the programs that we offer. So you're not just, we're not, you're not just joining the gym. So you're either buying into a 16 week, our fat loss system or muscle building system or good health system or whatever. We've got quite a lot of different systems which that's, what's, that's why people come back, because it's good what they get. It's, it's a whole package and a whole system that they get, get as part of their membership. Um, so it wasn't difficult to get back to pre-lockdown uh, numbers, and now we've got the most members we've ever had, but we've also got the most members we've ever had where it's all systemized, so myself and the other owner of Code don't actually need to work in the business anymore. So it's, I think it is. It's, it's what are you actually offering as part of your membership, and is that what people want? If it's not what they want, they won't buy it. I know if the systems that we've got, 95% will want to do the fat loss one. So any other system we create, like a women's physique one or muscle building one or good health one or resensitization, whatever it is, that's a small segment of our business. So a lot of our focus has to stay on the fat loss side. And then as we grow, we can develop more systems to gradually push everything else up. But by maximizing the fat loss ones, we're exactly back to where we were, and that, well, actually now we've got the most members we've ever had. Yeah, and that, that's, some, that's something that grew out of all the engagement stuff you did during lockdown, right? With, with, you, you, you had to at the time, yeah, but part, you developed those so partly, quickly, didn't we, you? We, still had, we had a lot of the systems in beforehand. We've just set them up in a way now where we don't have to be involved in doing them as a gym owner. We've got gym instructors who can do them because they are set systems. So people are buying into the systems. Yeah. So other, other thought, I've, I've got a couple of other thoughts on that, but if you've got other questions, there was one that came up. I'll get to that in a moment um, without getting onto the slide, slideo or moving off the screen. But either add your thoughts on member recovery or put your hands up if you've got some thoughts on that you want to talk about. Um, 
And if there's other questions you want to ask these guys or want to pick their brains, that's what they've, they've uh, volunteered here to do. So if you've got any, got any curveballs for them, then please let us know. Any, any more thoughts out there on um, what you're doing to recover members? Let's talk about blended, yeah, in club and online, because you've all talked, or you've talked about you know, online models and things like that, online coaching. Um, is, that, is that kind of you know, blending of the two different types of fitness, or the, the, the in the club and the outside the four walls? How's that working for either recovering or bringing new people in? You talked about it a little bit already, but uh, Andy, with, with the app. Are, are people converting or is it two separate? It, it works together, so uh, very similar probably to Steve. Um, if people sign up to one of the programs, we do get a percentage of our current members that sign up to that. So it's simply a more affordable option at this time. And I know we spoke about people looking to save money themselves, but the chances are they're not looking to, they're not worried about potentially five pounds extra onto their membership. They're worried about the 200, 250 pounds a month that's going on personal training. Suddenly if there's an option there for them that's 49 pounds a month that delivers them, you know, they just go to a class instead and then follow a program along and it's not too different, not too dissimilar, then that's where they're more likely to make the saving. I think like, like Steve has said, if you back yourself in the service that you're providing, you back your facility, you back your staff team as all being very high quality, um, then if you introduce an online element, you have that trust there already. Uh, and then so reaching out to those older members, th those members that have left your facility geographically, then they can do that and they can feel like they're part of something through an online community whilst they are over the other end of the country or even if they've gone from Scotland to England in a different country. Freedom, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that sums that up nicely. But there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's something about saving members as well. So there's members who are genuinely, even now, going, I can't afford that now. Not that maybe, well, you haven't put the prices up, but, well, let's keep them on something. Let's, let's save them. Let's keep them engaged. Let's keep them as part of the club, albeit just on the app. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just keeps them engaged in that community through the group chats, all of these different kind of things that they've got. So they may not necessarily be there in the facility, but they're involved, they're engaged, and they're, they're still maintaining those friendships and those networks. Yeah, so and, and, and you may get them back, or at some point, you, you, you've got more of a chance of getting them back than recovering someone who's currently not engaged or going out to the street and finding a brand new member, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Any other, any other, anything else to add on that? that I've, I've got another question if you haven't. Well, I can add. We, we do an online option as well as a very cheap uh, entry level online option that people can drop to as if they don't want to be a member of the gym. But reality, I think everybody was like, oh, everything needs to be online, everything needs to be online. As soon as the gym opened back up, everyone's back in the gym. People are going in the gym for the experience. People are going in the gym to get away from their home. Sometimes it's people's main thing of going out and doing it. Not everybody likes going out drinking. So you're going to the gym, you're meeting people, you're enjoying it. Uh, people like people don't want to train in their own. Most people don't want to train in their own. So we do have a blended option when it comes to online stuff, but it's definitely back in the gym is our way, our main way forwards. Yeah, yeah, and, a, and I guess a way of supporting the people who, if the people who are visiting three, four, five times a week, they don't need that. But someone who can only make it once a week now, they've got that uh, that additional support as well. Um, okay, any more thoughts on? recovery out there or different things people are trying. What do clubs want to know about how price sensitive current and new consumers are? So this is something we covered a little bit with the five pound increase and Andy talked about with the, the, the research. Um, it's an anonymous question so I can't ask for more detail. What do clubs want to know about how price sensitive current and new consumers are? David. David's question. I, I could have guessed it was David working the technology. <laughs> Thank you, Guy. Um, I, I was just really interested. If, if the, 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 the clubs that you're running, if you could do something, a survey or whatever, just to try and establish how sensitive your consumers are or potential consumers are, what is it that you'd want to know? Is it just straightforward, could you cope with a 5% increase? Or is there something more in there that would allow you to make some really insightful decisions about your pricing structures? So, yeah, great. Great question, and I want more than three answers for this, please. Number I, one. I, I think the more we know, the better on everything. 
the, the more we know on what they want as a service, what they want as a product, what they expect, the standards they expect. It's, the more information we have, the more we can then give them what they need. The, the price point comes down to then what they feel the value is and that we can offer more than that value with that product that we've created. So it's, it's like anything, when we first started and we picked the price we were gonna go at, I think we went at 79 pound and we got laughed at for the first year. Uh, I think we still get laughed at now for some, from some people. Why do you pay that for a gym? And then it's the ones who have joined who have done it have gone, all right, actually, this is really good value. When we can speak and sit with them every week one-to-one -one, as part of their membership, as part of their journey and experience in the gym, the value's there. If I was to put a value on it, I could do I'd double the price. Uh, I think it's worth it loads more than that, but will our market where we are in a small market town stand that price? I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a hard one with prices. So what would we want to know more of? Everything, I'd say, as vague as that is. Yeah, I hate to sit on the fence, but I kind of agree with that. It's so difficult because everybody's got their own reasons for pricing and what they expect, and particularly post-pandemic, what they expect, because that's obviously shifted. More people do expect online. And I think more pe it, it gave people time to shop around. So it's probably typical for a lot of us is I come up against, but the local authority is only seven pounds more than you. So again, then that goes back to we're a community gym and you have to really go big and sell on the community and it's not really about price and it's just educating them to understand this is not just a gym, it's not just a direct debit and you go in and you have to motivate yourself and go in a local authority. It's selling the whole community and it being like a 360 approach and almost steering them away from the price sensitive issue that they might have. Good answer. Andy, what, 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 what key piece of information would you want to know on this? Do Honestly, you know? I don't think there's any single piece of information. If someone's going to go based on price and price alone, they will go. And then your research is, do they come back? So we had a JD gym open up not too far down the road. We lost about probably 30 odd members um, to that gym. And it was largely based on the location. So that gym was simply more convenient than ours. And that's the number one factor that most people take into consideration when they join a gym. And then within about six months, we had 15 or 16 of those members come back and they all said the exact same thing. Like, your gym is so cheap for what you charge. And that is simply because they went to a budget gym and what did they get? They got a budget gym experience. Sure, it looked great and shiny when everything went in and it was all brand new, but then the plates start wearing, the rubber protectors on the racks are coming up, the clips are getting stolen, and it's still the same clientele that was there when it was an exercise for less. So then they come back to lift and it's what they remember. It's got the staff there constantly who are friendly and we pride ourselves on that. It's got the cleanliness. It's got, the, it's got more equipment and it's got a better range of equipment. And yes, it costs more, but it is worth it. And sometimes people just need to experience that. You go away somewhere else and you go, do you know what? I actually miss that. And I think if most of us here as gym owners, if we asked our members, a simple question, would you rather this gym was here or not here? Most of them are going to say, I would so much rather it was here and I will pay what it takes to keep it there. Yeah, and we saw... We saw Sorry, David, go on. I was just going to say, I now know why a gym chain in this country is currently spending a quarter of a million quid in trying to understand price sensitivity of their customers. Because actually, you want to know an awful lot of stuff, don't you, in order to make that decision? Yeah. Okay, thanks. But I, th I think that's where, with, without blowing smoke up as everyone's bum in the room, in, you know, that's where independents know their members and where their members know you. And you know, looking at some of the stories through the pandemic of members paying to keep the gyms closed, not to keep them closed, but to make sure they were going to be there when we were able to reopen. Yeah, the amount of support that Independence got that Rob was talking about at David Minton's event. You know, just just the amount of support that Independence got from their members through the pandemic, because your members know you, they know the owner. They don't know a couple of instructors and a couple of other members. You know, it, it is a relationship that you have with them, which is why it's so much, so much fun and so nice working with independents because you really know and care about your members. Um, so yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't come down to a, a survey or demographics. It comes down to knowing the people and then wanting to work out at your club. Anyway, enough of the rah, rah, rah for independents. Uh, any other questions? Any other thoughts? Or what, you know, what, what else do you want to... Pick these experts' brains on. Experts. 
Matt, I'll, Brad, I'll Matt, Matt Bradney are usually that. quiet in the I'll have a little bit Steve, there. yeah, go on. What, what question have you got? Didn't That's ask you the, guys. It's not the question. I'll just add to the bit on experts. I'm definitely not an expert. I've gone from part-time gym, gym instructor to PT to renting a gym to buying land and building a gym and now having the gym run itself. And I'm no expert on any of this. And that there's so many good people within the room who we can get help and support from. And that's why I think it's so good what Rob does with all of this, that we're all just trying and learning as we go along and seeing what works. And, and that's it. I haven't really got a point to what I'm saying apart from maybe a thanks to Rob and everyone else who's, who's here. And just know that we're, we all are in the same boat with what we're doing. It's just what we're gonna try and do. And definitely the best thing we ever did as a business was buying the land and building it. We've now got no landlord saying they're putting the rent up. Uh, the amount we pay in our loan repayments pay for the gym is the same price as what we were paying to rent five years ago. And that's fixed for another 10 years. Our electricity ain't gonna go up for another two years either, because that's fixed as well. So a lot of the stresses people have, we actually haven't got. Which that isn't me being a smug get sat on stage going, we haven't got these issues. That's me going, the more you can have it so it's your own responsibility, and everybody's gym's their responsibility, I'm not saying that, but the more you can control of what you're doing, the more choices you've got, the more, more decisions you can make and everything else. Yeah. yeah, Steve has to find his stress in different ways now, being on panels and stuff. I think one of, the, one of the biggest things is that there's people in this industry who are all incredibly passionate about what we do. And this, this isn't even a plug, but myself and Steve and I know a couple of other people that I've seen are on the UK Active Independent Operators um, Council. And the only way that we can help each other out is by actually talking to each other and saying what these issues are. And it's the only way we, we have to try and come together. Um, there's a reason why the, the, you know, the big chains with their hundreds of sites and their millions of pounds of marketing budget, et cetera, et cetera, can do these things and can spend a quarter of a million pound doing a survey. But we have to talk to each other. We have to try and band together as much as possible, share knowledge, share best practice to ensure that we can move forward as an industry and not just remain as fragmented as it has been in the past. Like when was the last time you actually spoke to another independent gym owner and said, what are you doing that's working for you? Here's what I'm doing. It's such a simple conversation to have, but it can make a massive, massive difference. And the best way as an industry to move forward is to try and pull together and have much, much less of the infighting and the little bickering and nitpicking that goes on. Have you seen that question go up? Or you just answered it, so well done. No, I haven't. I'm just <laughs> that good. Maybe I am an expert. Who knows? Oh, that, uh, yeah, I mean, a couple of words on the Independence Council, Steve. You've been to a couple of those meetings now. and Yeah, yeah. Uh, as Andy said, we're sitting on the panel for the uh, independent part with UK Active, and so is John, and Andy's involved, uh, sorry, Rob's involved as well. Uh, it's nothing that's going to get as far short-term. It's definitely long-term projects, but we need the input from independent gyms to be able to pass that on to UK Active, who can influence things at a lot higher level. Uh, the biggest thing they are pushing for is tax reforms, but whether we're going to get that in October, we don't know. But the, the, more, the more we can help, is that a hint to shut up? <laughs> the, the, more, the more everybody can speak to each other and help, the, the easier it is. And I think what you find as well, the more you speak to other gym owners, they like talking about their gyms. <laughs> They like telling you what they're doing. They like saying what's working. I think the whole secret thing is what people think, oh, they won't say that, they won't say that. Why not? Honestly, my gym's in Newark. Unless you're going to build a gym in Newark, do what I'm doing. I say it works for us. It might not work for someone else in a different area. I know buying a gym in London is very different to buying land in Newark, for example. But, yeah, the UK active stuff, we're trying. It's, it ain't easy. And I know, we know it's not going to be easy, but... We're trying, and we're trying to make a difference for the independent gyms and have a voice for them. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll just, I think I'll add a, a final note, because I think that that was an alarm. I said we should wind it up. Um, but absolutely echo. So I'm not on the council. I've been involved in kind of helping to form that and doing some research on it, but I'm not an independent gym owner. So it's not. For, but then neither is Rob. But Rob absolutely should be on that. And I think it's massive kudos to him and one of the reasons they put that together is because of not just this event but what Rob's doing with the, the independent gyms group so you know what started off as a Facebook group and I was always like it needs to be an event there's so much banter and advice and contracts and I want to buy a 
squat, thrust, something, I don't know. Um, but the, the kind of camaraderie and banter that's going on on that group was really powerful. But then to see it actually happening in a room in village hotels a few years ago, and then here for the third of these, um, this is the value in this room and all the conversations I've had today of people just exactly as you guys say, come together, share ideas, hopefully a little bit more of that in this panel debate, but really, yes, exhibitors, yes, education, blah, blah, but just get together, share ideas. If you are going to go and build a gym in Newark, don't talk to Steve. But that, that's, that's what it's all about for me. Continue it online in Facebook groups and LinkedIn groups, whatever, but come together for this kind of event. Continue the conversation in the pub afterwards, which I think starts to get to a wind up and thank you guys for all your thoughts um, I'm sure you'll have a lot more questions after this thank you all for joining in but mostly thank you to Rob for putting this on <laughs>